Welcome to Five Ways to Massive Profits. And the focus on this is how to build peak financial performance. That's the focus of today's webinar will be how to achieve peak financial results for you. So let's get started. Let's start a little bit about who I am and what Action Coach is. In fact, Action Coach is a franchised system and I am a franchise owner. Action Coach itself was started up in 1993. Uh, we see ourselves as the world's number one business coaching firm, principally because we have more than a thousand coaching offices scattered around the world. We operate in 70 countries worldwide. It's privately owned and was founded by Brad Sugars, who is himself an entrepreneur and author. He currently owns nine businesses, including Action Coach, uh, and he talks about them in some of the videos and recordings he has put out. Um, many of the things that we have, the systems that we use inside of Action Coach, are products of experience he has developed in, in the ownership of the businesses he currently has. The vision of Action Coach is world abundance through business re-education. And through this uh, COVID emergency, we are doing an awful lot of, we're putting out an awful lot of videos and putting in an awful lot of effort to helping as many people as we possibly can. We're trying to do what we can do to save as many small businesses as possible. Um, I'm part of what I am doing besides educational webinars like this, um, and we've just completed at, at 8.30 a uh, short conversation. Those small business owners who want to just chat, maybe get some ideas and some help, um, we'll, we'll be doing this on Monday mornings and Thursday mornings at 8 o'clock. So look for, the, um, look for the emails with the invitation. So you're welcome to just jump in and chat. All right. For myself, I originally grew up in Rochester, New York. I have an electrical engineering degree and I worked in an engineering capacity for a number of years. Uh, later, I went out and worked on an MBA from Bucknell and I completed that 22 years later after graduating with an electrical engineering degree. I have since then spent 20 some years running small business units for large industrial manufacturing corporations. A profit center unit like that operates very much like a small business with the original corporation as a bank. So I have very much of the same kinds of experiences trying to drive revenues up, trying to create cash flow, using doing that through hiring teams of people and leading teams to specific goals for that period. I did that for about five different business units, the last one of which I grew 300% in three years. Since then, I've been a business coach, a mentor, and a trainer for the last 10 years. So that's what gives me the experience applying the action coach principles to help people uh, that own small businesses. Now, let's start a little bit with frame of mind or mindset. And if you think of that, dot, that yellow dot is a point of power, then everything below that is disempowering. So you've met people through your lives that are dealing with blame, excuses, and denial. And if you ever want to think about blame and excuses and denial, just watch the news this week for a few minutes and you'll hear all about it. But in reality, blame, excuses, and denial is not going to get you where you want to go. And and there's an awful lot of denial in this COVID situation. People who are trying to not um, live up to what we have to do. Uh, people who don't want to accept the fact the world has changed. And that's not really going to be helpful. What we really want to get to is how do we take ownership of our situation in this particular world at this particular moment in time. If we can accept ownership that we are where we are, the reality is what it is, then we can be responsible for doing the things it takes to get to the next stage. We can think creatively and work at how do we find a path 
that keeps us successful, that keeps us growing, that keeps us moving forward. It might have to be a different path, but the goal stays the same. We, we own the, the actions that it takes to get to the goal that we want to achieve. And if we can stay focused on that, we can get what we want. If we're living in the world of blame, excuses, and denial, we've chosen to be powerless and a victim. If we take ownership of where we are and accept that we have to be responsible to do what it takes to get where we need to go, then we can be in charge of our destiny and we can do what it takes to achieve what we have to achieve. And this is the real key to the whole game, is taking ownership of where you're at now and that you have to be responsible for doing the things it takes to get to where you wanna to go to. With that thought, the only failure is the failure to participate. And if you noticed, I did not use the word try, I used the word participate. If you give 100%, you'll get 100%. The participate part means we have to, to jump in, think, take action, and do what it takes. Part of that is to lose these two words from your vocabulary in this sequence. And if you've got teenagers, you know what I'm talking about. I know mom, I know dad. These are not the kinds of thinking processes and self-talk that gets us to where we need to go. This does, if this does anything, it shuts off the, the ability to learn, the ability to think creatively, and it shuts off the ability to get where you want to go. So a much better place to go is to get rid of those words and replace them with the thought, isn't that interesting? If somebody has made something successful for them, then it's an interesting thought to learn a little bit more about and see if there's something that can contribute to you learning more and finding a, an idea or finding a key that will take you to where it is that you wanted to go in the first place. So we're gonna focus on what you can expect today. I'm going to try to share some BFOs or blinding flashes of the obvious to help you find paths to creativity, paths that will help us all grow, help us keep all small businesses operating that we can do better as we go forward. Now, in business, your time is your most valuable asset. And I'm going to thank you for sharing your time with me this morning. Remember, business does not really mean busyness. Our goal is results, not activity. Those two are not necessarily the same. So it's how you invest your time is one of the most important keys to your success in business. And this is what we have to focus on. What are the actions, what are the activities that you can use that makes your time most valuable and gets you the most results from it? Now, this, a lot of this focuses in on what's your real goal for your business, really? What does that really mean? Does that mean you have to be busy? Or does that mean the business has to be busy? And those are two two different things. Now, my hope is to reward your time this morning with some of the simplest, fastest, and easiest ways to increase your income in a profitable way. Um, I will just go on from there. So let's start with, when you decided to attend this webinar, what was it that you were specifically looking for? And if you would, I'd like you to add that into the chat box. And I'd like you to put it in there so that I can see it and that I've got the best ideas to make sure I share those with you. So if you could add that into the chat box, I will do my best to address those issues as we go along. I'll give you a minute for that. And certainly as we go through today, I'm gonna to repeat my point from the beginning. If you've got any questions, you want any clarification as we go along, please put it into the chat box and I will do my best to uh, either go back or do what I have to do to, to resolve that question. I wanna make sure you walk away from this with all the best ideas possible. 
Okay, general learning is always good. Thank you, Joel. Yeah, from a, from a new ideas point of view, this this I'm going to share a framework of thinking that's different than most people have about how to build consistent revenue, uh, and, and this will approach it from a significantly different angle. Okay, keep adding your comments, and I will I will pick them up as we go along. Let's start with. What is your definition of a business? And if you could add that into the chat box, what do you think of as a successful business? What would that look like to you? Have you ever thought of a definition of a successful business? So I'm not seeing any definitions. That's an interesting reaction. All right, so let's carry on. Here is a definition we present to people as a way to think differently about their business. Most small businesses think of their business as a route to a monthly income, but let's think beyond that. Think in terms of a commercial enterprise that is profitable and that works without the owner. Now think about that as a different, as, a, as think about that. What does that image create in your mind? Is that something that's interesting to you? Now, this does not preclude a person from being active in the business. It just says that there is a way to get it so it doesn't have to be completely run by you. That means it can run while you take a vacation without risk, without it shrinking, that you don't, you don't have to be there every day if you don't want to be there every day. It gives you opportunities that might be a little bit different from the ones that you've had in the past. So if you think about how to work on your business and not just in your business, it can offer you different kinds of opportunities later. This is why Brad Sugars can own nine businesses all at the same time. And even in this COVID situation, he's got some of them that are performing stellar and some of them that just plain flat had to shut down because of the situation that they were in. Uh, but he's managing to run nine large businesses, if you will, and not have, um, and, and not be full time in it. He's actually got a family with five kids and he's spending a lot of time teaching kids during the day because their schools are shut down. So he's able to do this. This is the kind of concept. If you want your business to run that way, it, it, it requires thinking about how to work on your business, not just in your business. Now, this, this really starts with some perspectives. Where are you now in your business? What revenue is your business generating? What kind of a place do you live in? What kind of a location do you live in? What kind of a car do you drive? What kind of investments, if any, have you made? Do you have travel plans? And I mean travel for fun kind of plans. It, what kinds of entertainment do you enjoy with your family? And, and most important, how much time are you working in the business on in the business activities. And then five years from now, what do you want to be doing? What then what revenue will your business be generating? What kind of a situation will you be living in at that time? What kind of a car will you be driving? What kind of investments will you have made? What kind of vacation places will you have traveled to? What kinds of entertainment are you and your family enjoying? How much time are you working in the business now? And if you think about what I just asked, you probably have to be working in the business a lot less in order to be doing some of those things. So what has to happen in between? And we don't think about a goal as a path that will take us someplace. What we want to be thinking about is what's the goal and then let the path unfold 
so that it helps us create the environment that we want to create for ourselves. So don't think of your goal as an outcome of the path you're already on. Invent a path that takes you to the result you really want. So that's a different way of approaching it than most people get themselves into. So keys to business success include leverage, people, systems, technology, sales, and marketing. We're gonna talk about a system today that contributes to the sales and marketing. That's when I talked about five ways to profits, this is where it's going to be. We're gonna be focusing on a system that helps you generate sales and marketing results. Now, this is I'm not gonna give you any magic bullets on how to advertise better today. I'm gonna to give you some generalities. And then if you wanna talk about specifics to your situation, we can talk about that offline because that's a much longer conversation than we have time for today. Now, first thoughts first. Many people think sales and marketing is an expense. Now, what do you think it is? Now, why do they think it's an expense? Well, if you use your P&L statement, the sales and marketing costs all land in the expense category on the profit and loss statement. That's just the nature of accounting. So it's money out. But we never really think, or many of us never really think too deeply about what does that mean? What does that provide? And if we rearrange our thinking that sales and marketing is an investment, then we have a whole totally different paradigm. And why would I think of it as an investment? Well, if we think about that every dollar out, a larger number of dollars should come in, then isn't that the definition of an investment? So in an investment, we're trying to create a return. We're trying to create more from a little bit up front. Well, that's really what sales and marketing costs should be. Now it's a case of how do we arrange it so that we can make sales and marketing an investment. And the first tool that we have to think about is what we call test and measure. So we take a particular promotional tool, whatever it might be, it could be a website, it could be SEO, it could be an ad on pay-per-click of some sort, um, it could be flyers, it could be an ad in the newspaper, it could be an ad on TV. If we test by trying it and seeing what kind of a result we get, and then we do another test with a slightly different presentation of whatever material it was, and then we measure the results of that and we compare the two against each other, then we can start to see ways to decide how do I get a better result? Now, a story I can share is of a business. It was actually a manufacturing business that was, the business itself was bought. And the new owner, when he bought it, the, the business was already advertising on TV, but it was costing a lot per customer. And that's the key. What's it cost to buy a customer? The cost per customer was something on the order of $80, $84 each. That was a lot because the gross profit that he was producing was pretty close to $84 each. So the new owner decided to keep going. He decided to start to, he would not have used TV advertising on his own to begin with if it didn't have it, but since it had it, he decided to start to play and he tweaked the ad over and over and over again. And so each time he tweaked it, he tried to get a better result. Now, not every time produced a better result, but over about 35 tests, he got it from $84 per customer to about $4 per customer. It took, he said there were some cases where he took that ad and had to go back to the previous ad because the new ad was poor, performed so poorly. But as they went along, they found a path to produce customers for $4 a piece. 
Now, then it was a profitable way to go. And he kept going with that. And when he sold the business, that was the, the, the situation that they had. They were still producing TV ads, but they were getting the results of about a customer for every $4 that they spent. The gross profit that they were producing for, per customer was very good. They were looking at lifetime value of that customer over time. The average lifetime value of, of their customers was about three and a half years, as I recall. And so they were able to produce a profit by continuing to do that over and over and over again. Now, that is a way to think about how to produce a return on investment by thinking that way. You don't just do an ad and say, well, it didn't produce a result that I wanted, so let's stop doing that media. You take a look at how do I make that media perform the way I need that media to perform. So if we can get into that kind of a concept and think that way, we start with thinking about how much does it cost to buy a customer? And now what do I mean by that? So if you invest $300 in advertising and you get 10 customers, then you paid $30 each. That's buying, that's the cost of buying each customer is $30 to buy one customer. Now then the question is, what can we do to reduce that cost? How can we change the ad? What can we do that makes that ad more efficient? Well, frankly, we will start with, does that particular media really get to the target market that we're looking for? Does it get to the kinds of people we want to sell to? And then what is it the message, what does the messaging need to be so that we can reduce that average cost and try to get it down to $20 and try to get it down to $10 and so on and so forth. And, and that we still spend $300, but we get two or three times as many customers. And that's the path to producing a better, uh, more profitable customer. The next thing we wanna think about is what's the average life expectancy of a customer? So for example, if you spend $550 uh, to buy a customer and you keep that customer for six years, or excuse me, if your customer spends $550 and you keep that customer for six years, that's 330 that's $3,300 to you over that, 600, uh, over that six years. How do you increase the life expectancy? How do you increase the value of that customer, how much they spend over the course of that period of time? And these are two different ways to think in terms of how do I get more customers? How do I get more money from the customers that I have? Now that's precisely what we're gonna be talking about. That's precisely what the system is that we wanna be looking at. And so I'm gonna show that. This is basically the five proven ways to increase your profits. So most, if you see the red labels there, most people think in terms of the number of customers that they've got. They think in terms of the number of, or the dollars of revenue that they're achieving and they might think about how much money that they're getting to take home. And whether you're thinking about it in terms of a year or a month or a week, that's generally the basis of how most small business owners think. But if you reverse that around a little bit and realize that the number of customers that you've got is not sy systemizable easily. But if you think about the number of leads you get, that can be systemizable. If you think about the number of the leads that you convert to customers as a number, that can be systemizable. And then if you go down and you look at the number of transactions per customer per year, you can make that systemizable. If you think about the average dollar sale that a customer spends, that too can be systemizable. And the number of customers times the number of transactions per customer per year times their average dollar sale is your revenue or your dollars of sales. If you think about your profit margin as an efficiency factor, that too 
can be systemizable. And part of that is looking at how do you, how efficient are you at using the expenses that you spend. Part of that is looking at how efficiently are you using your time. Are you getting the maximum amount of benefit out of time from each of your employees? So as you can start to think about your business in a systemizable way, and each one of these parameters can be systemizable. Let's put some numbers into that and see what that looks like for an example business. So same formula. Think about a business that gets 4,000 leads in a year. They convert 25 of those leads to customers. How many customers do they have? Well, it's pretty simple. It's 1,000 customers. Now, let's think about they get maybe on average two transactions per customer per year. Now, it might be that many of them just buy once, and it may be that many of them buy 10 or 12 times, but the average is two. Similarly, the, in this case, the average dollar sale is $100. Now, that might mean that some are buying at $10 and some are buying at $1,000 or $2,000, but the average is $100 per transaction. How much revenue do we, does this business have? Well, that's a $200,000 a year revenue, right? Now, if we think in terms of how efficiently does this, this business convert profit, we think in terms, in this case, of 25%. And so the owner is, taking, is able to take home $50,000 in the year. All right, so we've got a baseline. Now, suppose we did some work in this business and we took each one of those blue variables and we systematically worked over the course of a year to increase that by 10%. What would that look like? Well, if we increase the number of leads by 10%, what do we have? We've got 4,400 leads, yes? Now suppose we work at, at a, in a way, well, let's go back and stick with this. How might we increase the number of leads that, cust that company produces? Could be different work on the website, could be work on SEO, could be a blog, could be doing videos online and, and and shipping them and sending them off to your database. It could be flyers. It could be TV advertising. We talked a little bit about that. Uh, that's an expensive route to go, but it can work. Or radio advertising. Um, there's a, probably about 85 different ways to advertise and probably a dozen different ways to do, to do each one of those. So is it possible to increase the number of leads by 10% in a year. In this particular case, it was. Now, similarly with the conversion rate, is it possible to increase the efficiency of how well you convert leads to sales? How many people have ever taken formal sales training? Most have not. If we took sales training, could we increase our, our conversion rate efficiency by 10%? Similarly, if we increase the number of brochures and the number of tools, and it all depends on uh, what kind of a business that you've got, but if we improve the number of tools that your sales team has so that it's easier for them to convert sales, is it possible to increase just 10%. I'm not talking about going to 35%. I'm talking about going to 27.5%, just a little increase. Is that possible in your business? Well, if that is, and we've done both of those things in our business, how many customers does this business have now? No, it's not 1,100. 
it's 1,210. That's not a 10% increase of customers, that's a 21% increase of customers. So similarly with the number of transactions, if we did some stuff, we invited our customers to come back and buy more frequently, might some of them do it? Is it possible to increase the number of transactions from two to say 2.2? Might that require doing things a little bit differently? Maybe we have to um, send out flyers to our customers specifically. Maybe we have to go back and talk to them more often. Maybe we can do other things. Now, the, the really interesting piece of this is it costs six to six to 15 times less to keep a customer than it does to get a new customer. So the opportunities here can be extremely profitable if we can find ways to help them come, want to come back and buy more often. Maybe this is where special offers come in. Similarly, is it possible to offer extras at point of sale so that people buy more? Is it possible to increase the average transaction value per customer over time? A point of sale options, you know the grocery store has all of those magazines and gum and candies right at the, at the uh, cash register. Well, why do they do that? to help inspire more people buying more. What would stop you from doing the, something similar in your business by offering them something extra at the point of sale? If you're able to do all of these things, what might the new revenue look like in this particular case? So if we look at this one, 1,210 times 2.2 times 110, produces a number almost up to $300,000. That's a 46% increase just by looking at how we approach our business a little bit differently. Now this does require a lot of record keeping. This does require a lot of stopping and just looking at the results we got by this experiment and that experiment and seeing what we can do. But if we can do that, and we can look at our efficiency of how we use the money and time in our business, then we can have an increase of 10% in our profit margin and achieve a 61% increase in profit in a year. Now, is that an interesting kind of way to look at your business? Now, that's 46% increase in your revenue and a 61% increase in your profits. Tell me on the chat box, how many people would like that in their business? And while you're thinking about that, let's move on and let's pretend we did that for seven or eight years and we worked on how to increase our business in all these different factors but instead of a 10%, since we were working on it a little bit every year, we, we went for a 100% increase by going at it 10% at a time. Now, what would a 100% increase in the number of leads look like? Well, 4,000 leads now becomes 8,000 leads. And a 25% conversion rate becomes um, 50%. So the 1,000 customers becomes 4,000 customers. Now the number of transactions of two becomes four. The average dollar sale at 100 becomes 200. And the revenue stream goes from 200,000 to 3.2 million. Now this is a different business. A $200,000 business can probably be done by one person or two part with a part-timer. A $3.2 million business 
may not be able to be done by one person. It's gonna require putting a team in place. So that changes how we do stuff as we go along, but it opens up possibilities. If we work at efficiencies and, and how we do things, we systemize a lot of things, which we can do at 3.2 million, we can increase our profit margins significantly. And so now we're talking about a profit of 1.6 million. That's a different kind of business. I'm gonna, I've got a comment in here that I'd like that, but I'm not sure the relevance to a payroll business. It can be in this context, but it would be a different way to approach the business. This is a case of probably needing more salespeople and probably needing more processing people. This is a different scale business. Um, so it depends entirely on what your goal is in the business. If the goal is the profit, then this is a path you want to think about. If the goal is um, activity to do stuff, then this is probably not a path that you wanna take, but it is a way to think about it. How do I get as efficient as I possibly can? This is actually, a, 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 if you wanna do what, as much as you can as a one person business, to increase the number of transactions per customer, I see. Thank you, Joel. Yeah, in your particular business, that may be tricky. However, you're doing a couple of things in your business. You're not just doing payroll. You're also doing 401ks. So if you think about adding additional items in beyond just the payroll to a different services that you can add into the same customer, and you may have done that already. You may have increased that for, for a number. Exactly. So there are, every one of us has things we can add on. And so we, what we want to think about is, yes, we're focused on this one kind of transaction. <clears throat> Great. Get that transaction. What's in an additional thing that I can do? Now, we're in the COVID situation. <clears throat> How many businesses have you been hearing about in the news that have changed their business model completely to adapt to the moment. So for example, Ford and GM switching from manufacturing automobiles, well, basically what they do is assemble automobiles. Well, they've gone to assembling ventilators for a little while. <clears throat> 3M has upped its scale of um, masks, face masks. Other people have done other things. How many restaurants have converted their business from being a sit down restaurant to being a takeout food business, <clears throat> some of which are takeout um, raw food, some of which are takeout processed and cooked food into meals in various ways. I know of a food truck business that has stopped being a food truck business for uh, business parking lots and has become a delivery service for family meals. These are different kinds of ways people have taken their business, looked at the universe, said that the reality of the situation today is different from what it was a few months ago. How can I make my business successful adapting to these new circumstances? That's a lot of the same kind of thinking here, is sitting down and thinking about your business. What is the product you sell, but then change that and say, not what is the product I sell, not what is the industry I'm in, but what are the skills that I and my team have, and how can we apply those skills to help people, to help people solve a problem different from what I've done in the past. So if I'm really good at getting into new businesses and helping them solve one kind of problem, well, then I've got paths into businesses. What are the other problems that they're dealing with today? 
and what could I be selling today that will help me get through COVID in the, in the shutdown scenario? What are the things I could do differently with some of the skills, some of the skills that I've got? Now that might mean I've got to retrain people. I might, that might mean I need to learn some new stuff. But what can I do that solves problems that those people are dealing with today? Then he asking the question, is this a long-term product or is this something that just is going to be for the next few months? Now, it might, it's perfectly legitimate to make a plan for the just the next few months, but can I do this in a way that maybe adds another product layer onto the, the menu of products that I have to offer on a more permanent basis. So taking those restaurants as an example, how many of those restaurants can convert themselves permanently to food sales for the local neighborhood or for whatever other group that they can serve well, perhaps that's a new business line that they wanna think about from a, a long-term basis. Now, I doubt that car manufacturers are going to be producing ventilators forever. Uh, frankly, we're going to have all the ventilators we need fairly soon at some point. They've got a lot going through right now. But that opens up the process of thinking about what are the other kinds of machines that they could be assembling in addition to automobiles that would keep their plants full at all times. Perhaps they have opened up a door to a whole new way of thinking about their business and a whole new line of business opportunities in addition to just assembling cars. How can that fit into your business by thinking that way? What are the skills that you've created that make you successful now without limiting yourself by the industry that you think of yourself in right this minute? So for example, a cleaning company obviously could be doing disinfections, disinfectant kind of cleaning now. That's a different kind of thing. Does that open new doors to new possibilities for other kinds of businesses later as the, uh, as the lockdown begins to be released and we can start doing other things? So this is the kind of thinking, organizing your thoughts in these kinds of ways can help drive your business to a whole new level if that's what you wish. So is that really possible to do in your business? And that depends entirely on you. What do you want from your business? You're, you've put a lot of work into it so far. You've made a lot of effort to learn how to be successful to a certain level at this point. What do you want from all of that work? You certainly don't want to be earning the same thing that your employees are earning. So what do you want and how far do you want to go with this? So at this point, I'm going to make an offer. There are two ways you can go from here. Obviously, you can go, you can continue doing what you're doing. Or if you want to try to get some massive results quickly, I'm going to make an offer that we could sit down and chat together privately on a one-to-one -one session for about an hour, hour and a half to see what of these principles can help you get, get where you want to go. And my, you got, you, I think all of you have my contact information. If not, it's right there. Uh, the phone number is my cell phone number, not my office number. It's my cell phone number because I'm working from home at the moment and the cell phone's sitting right here next to me. Um, we can sit down and chat. Um, Action Coach has volunteered us all to offer one hour of free coaching, actually five hours of free coaching per week. So I'm kind of, I'm quite happy to share and talk and see what we can do that would help your business make the next step. If we decide to do something past that, that's fine. Uh, but I'm, I'm offering that right now to whomever wants to go there. So I'm gonna open this up to you. What questions do you have? I've put a lot of information on the table. What do you see that you wanna do with your business or do you want me to go back and look at a relook at a piece of what I just showed you in a different way. 
How does the system work for nonprofit challenges during this time? Yes, Sheila, that's a very interesting question. Um, I'm actually on the board of a um, charity and we're struggling with this question too. Uh, the, the question is how, how do you get people's attention towards your nonprofit? So is this a, a charity or is this a, a different kind of nonprofit? And, and, and just to charity, got it. The principles are the same. So how good is your database in terms of generating um, incoming funds? In, in the charity I'm on the uh, board for, we, we still call it revenue. Um, how do you generate revenue now? So you've got some attention to new, new donors and you've got past donors. Do whatever you can to be in touch with your past donors, just as though it was a business. It's exactly the same kinds of effort. You've got, you've got activities that you do to generate revenues, to generate new donations. Continue to do as many of those as you can. Try to find ways to convert them to virtual. And I know we're going through this right now. Uh, we do a poker tournament in September, which we think we're going to be able to pull off because it's September. And we do a, gay, a big gala in uh, November. Those are our two big fundraisers. And we are really working hard trying to figure out, are we going to be able to run those? And how are we going to run those this year? Look for as many different virtual approaches as you possibly can. Advertise, 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 but certainly go back to your past donors and do whatever you can to get them to come back again and again and again and again. It's exactly the same kind of thinking. You just have to, you just have to rearrange how your messaging works relevant to the specific charity. If there's no other questions, then I will go on to the end. Jim Rohn, never wish your life was easier. Wish that you were better. Work harder on yourself than you do on your job. And I'm going to recommend it is time for you to get into action. It's not what you know. It's what you do with what you know. So let's get out there and get doing some stuff that we can make an impact. My personal goal is to save as many businesses through this period of time as I possibly can. And so if you can think of some things I can do that helps, I'd appreciate your input. I'd love to hear. Thank you all very much and have a great day. That is the end of what I was hoping to cover today.